Hello, everybody. Welcome to day four of reading through the Bible in 365. Um, today, we are going to be focusing on 1 Kings chapter 16, chapter 17, and chapter 18. And Luke chapter 22, verses 47 to 71. And hopefully my tongue is not going to get a workout with all of these hard to pronounce names, but it probably will because that's just the way it's been in at least First Kings. So, First Kings, we'll start with First Kings chapter 16. This message from the Lord was delivered to King Baasha by the prophet Jehu, son of Hanana. Ha See, here we go again. Hanani, Han Hanani, Hanani. <laughs> I believe it was Hanani. I lifted you out of the dust to make you ruler of my people Israel, but you, but you have followed the evil example of Jeroboam. You have provoked my anger by causing my people Israel to sin. So now I will destroy you and your family, just as I destroyed the descendants of Jeroboam, some of Nebat. The members of Baasha's family who die in the city will be eaten by dogs, and those who die in the field will be eaten by vultures. The rest of the events in Baasha's reign and the extent of his power are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. When Baasha died, he was buried in Terza. When his son, Elah, Ela, became the next king, then his son, Elah, became the next king. The message from the Lord against Baasha and his family came through the prophet Jehu, son of Hanani. It was delivered because Baasha had done what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as the family of Jeroboam had done, and also because Baasha had destroyed the family of Jeroboam. The Lord's anger was provoked by Baasha's sins. Elah, son of Baasha, began to rule over Israel in the 26th year of King Asa's reign in Judah. He reigned in the city of Terza for two years. Then Zimri, or Zimri, who commanded half of the royal chariots, made plans to kill him. One day in Terza, Elah was getting drunk at the home of Arza, the supervisor of the palace. Zimri walked in and struck him down and killed him. This happened in the 27th year of King Asa's reign in Judah. Then Zimri became the next king. Zimri immediately killed the entire royal family of Baasha, leaving him not even a single male child. He even destroyed distant relatives and friends. So Zimri destroyed the dynasty of Baasha as the Lord had promised through the prophet Jehu. This happened because of all the sins Baasha and his son Elah had committed, and because of the sins they led Israel to commit. They provoked the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, with their worthless idols. The rest of the events in Elah's reign and everything he did are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. Zimri began to rule over Israel in the 27th year of King Asa's reign in Judah, but his reign in Terza lasted only seven days. The army of Israel was then attacking the Philistine town of Gibbethon. <laughs> when they heard that Zimri had committed treason and had assassinated the king that very day, they chose Omri commander of the army as the new king of Israel. So Omri led the entire army of Israel up from Gibbethon to attack Terza, Israel's capital. When Zimri saw, did I say Zimri or Zimri before? Zimri saw that the city had been taken. He went into the citadel of the palace and burned it down over himself and died in the flames. 
for he too had done what was evil in the Lord's sight. He followed the example of Jeroboam in all the sins he had committed and led Israel to commit. The rest of the events in Zimri's reign and his conspiracy are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. But now the people of Israel were split into two factions. Half the people tried to make Tibni, son of Ginnath, their king, while the other half supported Omri. But Omri's supporters defeated the supporters of Tibni. So Tibni was killed and Omri became the next king. Omri began the rule over Israel in the 31st year of King Asa's reign in Judah. He reigned 12 years in all, six of them in Tirzah. Then Omri bought the hill known as Samaria from its owner, Shemer, for 150 pounds of silver. He built a city on it and called the city Samaria in honor of Shemer. But Omri did what was evil in the Lord's sight, even more than any of the kings before him. He followed the example of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, in all the sins he had committed and led Israel to commit. The people provoked the anger of the Lord and the God of Israel with their worthless idols. The rest of the events in Omri's reign the extent of his power and everything he did are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. When Omri died, he was buried in Samaria. Then his son, Ahab, became the next king. Ahab, son of Omri, began to rule over Israel in the 38th year of King Asa's reign in Judah. He reigned in Samaria 22 years, but Ahab, son of Omri, did what was evil in the Lord's sight, even more than any of the kings before him. And as though it were not enough to follow the sinful example of Jeroboam, he married Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbaal of the Sidonians. And he began to bow down in worship of Baal. First, Ahab built a temple and an altar for Baal in Samaria. Then he set up an Asherah pole. He did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the other kings of Israel before him. It was during his reign that Hiel, a man from Bethel, rebuilt Jericho. When he laid its foundations, it cost him the life of his oldest son, Abiram. And when he completed it and set up its gates, it cost him the life of his youngest son, Zagub. Zagub? Zagub. Zagub. I'm sorry, I'm butchering names. This all happened according to the message from the Lord concerning Jericho, spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. On to chapter 17. Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go to the east and hide by a Kareth brook, near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. So Elijah did as the Lord told him and camped beside Kareth brook, east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. But after a while, the, book, the brook dried up, for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. When the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarep Zarephath near the city of S Sidon, I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So, 
he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, Would you please bring me a little water and a cup? As she was going to get it, he called to her, Bring me a bite of bread, too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house, and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. But Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Sometime later, the woman's son became sick. He grew worse and worse, and finally he died. Then she said to Elijah, O oh, man of God, what have you done to me? Have you come here to point out my sins and kill my son? But Elijah replied, Give me your son. And he took the child's body from her arms, carried him up the stairs to the room where he was staying, and laid the body on his bed. Then Elijah cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, why have you brought tragedy to this widow who has opened her home to me, causing her son to die? And he stretched himself out over the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, please let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's prayer, and the life of the child returned, and he revived. Then Elijah brought him down from the upper room and gave him to his mother. Look, he said, your son is alive. Then the woman told Elijah, now I know for sure that you are a man of God and that the Lord truly speaks through you. Chapter 18. Later on in the third year of the drought, the Lord said to Elijah, go and present yourself to King Ahab Tell him that I will soon send rain. So Elijah went to appear before Ahab. Meanwhile, the famine had become very severe in Samaria. So Ahab summoned Obadiah, who was in charge of the palace. Obadiah was a devoted follower of the Lord. Once, when Jezebel had tried to kill all the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had hidden a hundred of them in two caves. He put 50 prophets in each cave and supplied them with food and water. Ahab said to Obadiah, We must check every spring and valley in the land to see if we can find enough grass to save at least some of my horses and mules. So they divided the land between them. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. As Obadiah was walking along, he suddenly saw Elijah coming toward him. Obadiah recognized him at once and bowed low to the ground before him. Is it really you, my lord Elijah? He asked. Yes, it is, Elijah replied. Now go and tell your master Elijah is here. Oh, sir, Obadiah protested, What harm have I done to you that you are sending me to my death at the hands of Ahab? For I swear by the Lord your God that the king has searched every nation and kingdom on earth from end to end to find you. And each time he was told Elijah isn't here. King Ahab forced the king of that nation to swear to the truth of his claim. And now you say, Go and tell your master Elijah is here. But as soon as I leave you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you away to who knows where. When Ahab comes and cannot find you, he will kill me. Yet I have been a true servant of the Lord all my life. 
Has no one told you, my Lord, about the time when Jezebel was trying to kill the Lord's prophets? I hid 100 of them in two caves and supplied them with food and water. And now you say, go and tell your master Elijah is here. Sir, if I do that, Ahab will certainly kill me. But Elijah said, I swear by the Lord Almighty, in whose presence I stand, that I will present myself to Ahab this very day. So Obadiah went to tell Ahab that Elijah had come, and Ahab went out to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw him, he exclaimed, So it is really you, you troublemaker of Israel. So is it really you, you troublemaker of Israel? I have made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are the troublemakers, for you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the images of Baal instead. Now summon all Israel to join me at Mount Carmel, along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who are supported by Jezebel. So Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. When Elijah stood in front of them and said, How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only prophet of the Lord who is left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Now bring two bulls. The prophets of Baal may choose whichever one they wish and cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood of their altar, but without setting fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood on the altar, but not set fire to it. Then call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God. And all the people agreed. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Go first, for there are many of you. Choose one of the bulls and prepare it, and call on the name of your God. But do not set fire to the wood. So they prepared one of the bulls and placed it on the altar. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noontime, shouting, O oh, Baal, answer us! But there was no reply of any kind. Then they danced, hobbling around the altar that they had made. About noontime, Elijah began mocking them. You'll have to shout louder, he scoffed, for surely he is a god. Perhaps he is daydreaming, or is he relieving himself? Or maybe he is away on a trip or is asleep and needs to be wakened. So they shouted louder and following their normal custom, they cut themselves with knives and swords until the blood gushed out. They raved all afternoon until the time of the evening sacrifice, but still there was no sound, no reply, no response. Then Elijah called to the people, come over here. They all crowded around him as he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. He took 12 stones, one to represent each of the tribes of Israel, and he used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. Then he dug a trench around the altar large enough to hold about three gallons. He piled wood on the altar, cut the bull into pieces, and laid the pieces on the wood. Then he said, Fill four large jars with water and pour the water over the offering and the wood. After they had done this, he said, do the same thing again. And when they were finished, he said, now do it a third time. So they did as he said, and the water ran around the altar and even filled the trench. At the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O oh Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God 
and that you have brought them back to yourself. Immediately, the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried out, The Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. Then Elijah commanded, Seize all the prophets of Baal. Don't let a single one escape. So the people seized them all, and Elijah took them down to the Kishon Valley and killed them there. Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go, get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. So Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and bowed low to the ground and prayed with his face between his knees. Then he said to his servant, Go, and look out toward the sea. The servant went and looked, then returned to Elijah and said, I didn't see anything. Seven times Elijah told him to go and look. Finally, the seventh time, his servant told him, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. Then Elijah shouted, Hurry to Ahab and tell him, Climb into your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. And soon the sky was black with clouds. A heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm, and Ahab left quickly for Jezreel. Then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his cloak into his belt and ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. All right, moving on to Luke chapter 22, verses 47 to 71. But even as Jesus said this, a crowd approached, led by Judas, one of the twelve disciples. Judas walked over to Jesus to greet him with a kiss. But Jesus said, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? When the other disciples saw what was about to happen, they exclaimed, Lord, should we fight? We brought the swords. And one of them struck at the high priest's slave, slashing off his right ear. But Jesus said, no, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus spoke to the leading priests, the captains of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him. Am I some dangerous revolutionary, he asked, that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there every day. But this is your moment, the time when the power of darkness reigns. So they arrested him and led him to the high priest's home. And Peter followed at a distance. The guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it, and Peter joined them there. A servant girl noticed him in the firelight and began staring at him. Finally, she said, This man was one of Jesus' followers. But Peter denied it. Woman, he said, I don't even know him. After a while, someone else looked at him and said, You must be one of them. No, man, I'm not, Peter retorted. About an hour later, someone else insisted, This must be one of them because he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, Man, I don't know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. At that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Suddenly, the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times, or you will deny three times that you even know me. And Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. The guards in charge of Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and said, Prophesy to us! Who hit you that time? And they hurled all sorts of terrible insults at him. <coughs> Excuse me. At daybreak, all the elders of the people assembled, including the leaders 
no, including the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. Jesus was led before this high council and they said, tell us, are you the Messiah? But he replied, if I tell you, you won't believe me. And if I ask you a question, you won't answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated in the place of power at God's right hand. They all shouted, So are you claiming to be the Son of God? And he replied, You say that I am. Why do we need, another wi Why do we need other witnesses, they said. We ourselves heard him say it. All right, that wraps up day four of reading through the Bible in 365, and I will see you in the next one, and I am so sorry that I butchered all those names, but hey, have a great day, everybody.